Now turn your eyes to the right, Bob. Mm -hmm. Now to the left. Mm, that's good. Well, that'll be all for today. Well, uh, w what's the verdict, Doc? How much longer is it going to be? Hey, Doc, are uh, you still there? Yes, I'm here, Bob. Yeah, well, we'll speak up. Well, I can take it. Is it going to be two months, six months? You don't have to be afraid to tell me. You aren't going to see again, Bob. Oh, no. Is this your idea of a joke? But he only had a bump on the head, not even a scratch. Both retinas are completely detached. It must have been the shock when you were thrown from the car. It happens like this uh, sometimes. You must be wrong. I'll, I'll get over it. Surely there's something you can do, some sort of operation. We'll, we'll check with somebody else, a specialist in the city. Yes, we'll find someone. It's not that we think you haven't done your best, Doctor, but we just... Perfectly all right, Anne. I understand. And you can see someone else if you like, Bob. But I'd be doing you an injustice if I let you believe that any other doctor could give you any hope. Well, then it's, it's final? There isn't any hope? It's final. I wish there was some way that I could... But there isn't. Well, I'll be in again tomorrow. Goodbye, Bob. Why did you have to do it that way? Why, it's like hitting him over the head with a club. Couldn't you have used a little tact? Tried to soften it a little bit? I wish I could have. I wish there were some way you could tell a man that he's blind without being blunt about it. But, but he has to know. He can't, he won't even try to start to, to pick up the pieces until he knows for sure he has to. No, let him. Later on, he'll need you. But this is a grief he can't share with anyone else. You are sure? There's no hope. Not that he'll ever see again. But he can still lead a good life, Anne. He won't believe that for a while, but he can. And this is a hope that I can leave you and him. I'll see you tomorrow. No hope. No hope. Those were the only words that stayed with me. I couldn't believe, and I'm sure Bob couldn't believe, that there could be much of a life ahead for him now. Bob retreated behind a barrier. A barrier worse than blindness. I took him home from the hospital, but I couldn't take him back to the way it had been. Day after day, I watched him sitting in his chair. Not even rocking, just sitting there. How could I help him? What could I do? I tried inviting some friends. It didn't work. He thought they came out of pity. And he was so afraid of being pitied that he lashed out at them if they offered even friendly sympathy. He didn't eat much. He couldn't sleep. I tried everything. He didn't help. He didn't have any spirit left, and my heart was breaking, too. Why did it have to happen to him? Bob. Oh, Bob. And then one day, Dr. Allen, on one of his regular calls,
brought with him someone who was to help Bob see that there was a way across the barrier. And I want you to meet Mrs. Adams. She's a home teacher from the Division of Services for the Blind State Welfare Department. She's been very helpful in a number of cases like Bob's, and I knew you wouldn't mind if I brought her by. Oh, I sure. How do you do, Mrs. Adams? Hello. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I will if you'll show me where the chairs are. You mean you're... That's right. I'm blind, too. Oh, I am glad you came. Please sit down to this chair right in back of you here. Oh, I, I just couldn't understand. I've been doing all the wrong things, but you... Well, you know what it's like for him. You can help. Bob! Bob! There's someone here to see you. It's Dr. Allen. And he's brought a friend. From then on, Mrs. Adams came as often as she could. She showed Bob how he could find his things for himself. How he could tell his toothbrush from another. She showed him how to manage at the table. Did you know that a salt shaker is usually heavier than a pepper shaker? It's fairly easy to tell them apart. Mrs. Adams could help Bob with some of the mechanics of living but he still hadn't accepted his blindness. Once he almost seemed to after one of her visits. I was almost to the end of my rope, some days aching to help him, to protect him, while he flared out at me to leave him alone, to watch him grope and stumble and shut me out. And other days retreating pitifully eager for sympathy, wanting me to do it all. Oh, I know it was hard for Bob, but it was hard for those who loved him, too. I'll always remember the day Mrs. Adams brought with her a Mr. Harris, a rehabilitation counselor from the Division of Services for the Blind. They talked to Bob about going to the rehabilitation center for adult blind in Topeka. Bob wouldn't even listen. It was too soon, he said. He didn't know his way around home yet. How could he face life in an institution for three months? That's where you're wrong, Bob. The sooner you go, the better. It isn't what you've lost that counts anymore. It's what you have left. And at the center, we can find out what to do with what you have left. We can put you back to work, Bob. We can. If you'll admit you're blind and that it's permanent. It's true. It's true. It's true. I am blind. Once Bob had faced his blindness, Mr. Harris arranged the preliminaries to get him admitted to the center. One of these was a test to see if he had any useful vision left. Sometimes people are admitted who have partial vision, and the center arranges their program to make the most of it. But Bob wasn't one of these. His blindness was total. And finally, Bob came to this place that would be his home until he learned to live as a blind man. I went along on the trip to Topeka, and I must say I was impressed. The rooms in the dormitory buildings where the men and women lived during their stay were bright and cheerful. I met Bob's roommate. I couldn't see how Bob would be able to mope with him around. There was a comfortable dining room full of clatter and conversation and the smell of good food. And downstairs in the recreation room, a blind instructor showed people like Bob that they could get back into shape. Bob was interested in the exercise equipment. A man doesn't like to go soft, the way you can in a rocking chair. When it was time for me to go back home, to leave him, I knew I was leaving him in good hands. From Bob's letters, I learned that the first week was pretty easy going. Time to get acquainted and to learn his way around the center. And then more testing began. 
Bob wrote that he'd never been checked on so many things since final week at school. Surprisingly, they tested his hearing. Where did that sound come from? And that one. It was confusing. It was nerve-wracking. He wanted to please them, but he couldn't tell whether he was measuring up or not. How was his equilibrium? From now on, Bob would move in a world without horizons. And like all newly blind, he soon realized how much his sense of balance had depended upon his sight. The test included one in which he was asked to identify different odors. Why, he wanted to know. Well, suppose in the future he wanted to find a restaurant or a barber shop in the middle of a block. His nose could tell him when he was there. His sense of touch was checked. You'd think that anyone could master Braille, but Bob learned that unless his fingertips were sensitive enough to distinguish the closely grouped dots, Braille was impractical. It was a tough schedule, but it had to be done. In this long series of physical and psychological examinations, the staff at the center charted Bob's adaptability, his intelligence, and his emotional adjustment. They had to know him before they could begin to help him. And now the hours and hours of training began. Obstacle perception, learning to locate objects by using his other senses. Cane techniques, learning to use his cane to point out the safety of his next step. Elimination of undesirable mannerisms, like the rocking motion Bob had developed during his long weeks in the rocking chair. So much to learn and so much to unlearn. It seemed to go on and on. He still had moments when it didn't seem worthwhile, when the rocking chair seemed easier and safer and better all the way around. What kept him going was the showing he made in the work performance tests. The center is not a vocational school. That comes later but they did try him out in a variety of basic skills. Woodwork, hand tools, weaving, pottery, metalworking. But well, Bob found out that once an electrician, always an electrician. Of course, he'd never be able to go back to line work, but with his knowledge of circuits and his interest in radio, together with a few special tools designed for blind workers, why the field of electronics was wide open to him. Occasionally, Mr. Harris dropped in to see how Bob was getting along. Well, they're going all out to train me here, but I can't help wondering if I'll ever get a chance to use it. Will, will anybody actually hire me? Everybody feels that way, Bob. We're just as interested in seeing that you get a good job as you are. The Division of Services for the Blind spends a lot of time and money to get just the right job for each individual. Some of the blind who leave the center operate concession stands as independently as any other small businessman. Those who show the ability to keep pace in a competitive occupation are placed in businesses where they work right along with sighted employees. And for those who need special consideration, there are sheltered workshops operated by the Division of Services for the Blind. Some few prefer to work in their own homes. And for them, as well as for the shop workers, the Division of Services for the Blind carries out the work of distributing and marketing their goods. From this warehouse in Topeka, blind-made products from Kansas are shipped to points all over the United States. But it wasn't all just tests and training for Bob. There was a get-together at least once a week. Games, music, dancing. I think he was as surprised as anyone to find that he could relax and laugh again. A high spot of Bob's week was the group therapy time, when he and his fellow clients met with the staff psychiatrist to talk over their problems and their successes. Bob said later, but it was these meetings that helped him to realize that he was still a complete and worthy person, 
not inferior because of his blindness, only different. And that his big job was to learn to live with his differences. I think it's significant that after Bob had mastered enough Braille to read a book, the first one he chose was one that showed his interest in other people. He got a lot of pleasure out of his hours in the arts and crafts room. All about him were other blind men and women enjoying creative activities that could be the basis for hobbies all the rest of their lives. I'll always treasure the letters I got from Bob. They couldn't possibly tell me all I wanted to know, but the signature was a good clue. Week after week, it became more bold and confident, more like the old Bob. And then came the one with the invitation. I wonder if you could take the 215 bus to Topeka Friday. Just wait in the station. There'll be someone there to meet you. Nobody. I, I know my way around. You mean you came downtown all by yourself? Yep, just, just me and Esmeralda. Oh. You know, today's kind of like a graduation day. The big test they've been building me up to for weeks. Out on the town without a guide. To tell you the truth, I didn't think I could do it. I was scared to death. Well, then, I got the idea of having you meet me here, and, well, I, I knew I just had to make good. Oh, Bob. Hey, now, none of that. Come on, let's celebrate. <laughs> Don't worry. It's not how you fall, it's how you bounce that counts. wonderful day together, Bob and I. It was almost like getting acquainted all over again, a first date. With Bob's new viewpoint, the world was bright once more. In his closing days at the center, Bob and his counselor had decided that Bob should enroll immediately at a trade school to brush up on radio. He was eager to be off, and yet he hated to go. These people had meant a lot in his life. But the help they had already given him didn't end the division's concern for Bob's welfare. When he had completed his trade school training in electronics, Mr. Harris made a special trip to go to bat for Bob and his ability as a worker. Well, I sure agree in spirit with what you're doing. I can't do very much, but if $25 will Mr. help, Wells, I don't want a contribution. I'm talking about a job for Bob, work. I know, but I just don't see how All I All we're asking is for you to give him a chance. Mr. Harris, look at my position. I honestly don't believe that a man can work on radios and not see what he's doing. But if I should hire him and then found out that he couldn't, do you think I'd have the heart to let him go? Well, this is how we feel about it. If he can't do everything we say he can do, you won't have to replace him. We will. So what if he has an accident? Now, this place can't slow Mr. down for... Well, I've been trained to be safe. And, well, that, that's more than most people can say. There you are. Bob's not afraid. No, you're persistent. All right, he needs work. He wants work. But why me? Because we want him where he can do the most good, and we think this is the place. Well, I don't pay very much to start. You don't have to. Just start. You're willing, Bob, knowing how I feel? When do I go to work? Monday morning, I guess. Thank you very much, Mr. Wells. Thanks a lot. You won't be sorry. With all the crazy ideas. A blind man.
And that's about the end of my story. Bob, practically an invalid when I took him to Topeka, was back with me again. A man. A man who does a day's work for a day's pay. Bob lives and laughs and enjoys his friends again. We've won. And I'm grateful. <laughs> yes, sir, you know Bob's one of the best workers I've got. I just can't get over it. I understand he was about as far down as a man can go, but he's made a terrific rebound and he's still going up. Yes, it's pretty wonderful, the thing. You mean what the state program for the blind can do? Well, that too, but even more what a man can do. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear you. Oh, oh, nothing, nothing, just, just an old poem. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. The story you have just seen is typical. Each year, the Division of Services for the Blind of your State Welfare Department, as well as your County Welfare Office, helps to salvage many lives that might be blighted returning the blind to a happy and useful place in society. But this isn't the whole story. We want no one to be blind whose sight may be saved. There is a statewide program of medical care to restore eyesight and an ever active campaign to prevent blindness. In addition, there is aid for parents in guiding preschool blind children. There are also tools and aids for the blind, including talking book services and help with leisure time problems of the elderly blind. Many who could use these services may not even be aware of them. If you have a relative or friend who could profit by such help, tell him about the division of the services for the blind. He can contact them through the county welfare office. This is your service. We urge you to use it.